besides defeating King Pharnaces of the Bosporus at the Battle of Zella, which Caesar accomplished in a mere five days, he had also negotiated an end of hostilities in both Hispania and Illyricum. Sending a dispatch to Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, to whom Caesar had given the governorship of Hispania Citeria, Caesar had asked Aemilius Lepidus to formally mediate between his governor of Hispania Ulteria, Quintus Cassius Longinus, and the faction of Pompeians who had risen up against him. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, who was married to the second daughter of Caesar's mistress, Servilia Caepionis, discovered that the Pompeian uprising was the result of mismanagement and corruption on the part of Quintus Cassius. Knowing that the devices of Quintus Cassius had cast a negative light on Caesar, Lepidus arranged a settlement with the Pompeians which saw King Bogard of Mauritania returning to his home, and Quintus Cassius immediately removed and forced into retirement, replaced by another of Caesar's men, Gaius Trebonius. In Illyricum, the Pompeian commander, Marcus Octavius, continued to lead assaults against towns and Caesarian garrisons. Before sailing for Egypt, Caesar had installed Aulus Gabinius to secure the area. As a tribune of the plebs, Aulus Gabinius had passed the Lex Gabinia, giving Pompeius Magnus command over the entirety of the Mediterranean basin. As governor of Syria, Gabinius had abandoned his province, marching into Egypt to interfere with Egyptian politics, leaving his Gabiniani legions to guard the throne on behalf of Pompeius Magnus. His behaviour led to his exile when Cicero failed to secure his acquittal at trial. Owing his freedom to Caesar, yet not wanting to fight directly against his old friend, Pompeius Magnus, Aulus Gabinius left for Illyricum. There he stormed towns and strongholds which had gone back to the Pompeians. However, when Aulus Gabinius fell ill and died, Illyricum's quester, Quintus Cornificius, sought the aid of Publius Vatinius, who was in Brundisium. Vatinius, a very strong Caesarian partisan, answered the request, and following a battle against the fleet of Marcus Octavius near the island of Taurus, Vatinius captured 85 ships that had belonged to the Pompeian commander, Octavius. With Illyricum's coastline now clear, and Marcus Octavius fleeing for Africa, Vatinius took leave of the region and returned to Brundisium. No longer required to personally oversee the situations in Illyricum and Hispania, Caesar turned his attention to Africa. Under the allied leadership of Cato, Metellus Scipio, and Titus Labienus, the Pompeian forces were being rebuilt, and it appeared as though Caesar would have to fight the Pompeian civil war all over again. Returning to Italy to gather troops stationed there under the command of Marcus Antonius, Caesar found Marcus Tullius Cicero awaiting him upon his landing at Brundisium. Caesar claims to have been overjoyed to see Cicero waiting there on the docks. As the two of them walked from the harbour, Caesar and Cicero intentionally fell behind and dropped out of earshot of their body of lictors, able to spend several hours talking privately. It is likely that Cicero advised Caesar of the disastrous events which had taken place in Rome while the dictator had been absent in the east. Not only had Marcus Antonius, as acting dictator, allowed the Forum Romanum to come under the occupation of those wishing to see a debt relief bill enacted, but Antonius had marched across the Pomerium with his legions, seeing to it that those poor citizens were butchered. Antonius was allegedly enjoying his ascendancy too much, showing up late to Senate meetings either completely intoxicated or sick and hung over. Although Caesar, in his capacity as dictator, had not confiscated the properties belonging to Pompeius Magnus, Marcus Antonius had taken it upon himself to appropriate Pompeius's Palatine villa from the sons of Pompeius, who were the legal beneficiaries. Despite the fact that Cicero had favoured a Pompeian dictatorship over a Caesarian, given Caesar's ruthless punishment of those Gallic tribes who had rebelled against him, the aging orator now expressed the Senate's utter relief that Caesar had finally arrived in Italy, begging Caesar to take matters in hand. Not only did Marcus Antonius need a check on his power, but this push for radical debt relief legislation, which had led Marcus Caelius Rufus and Titus Annius Milo to their deaths, was now dragging Cicero's son-in-law, and one of Caesar's favourites, Publius Cornelius Dolabella, down a similar path. As Caesar travelled from Brundisium to the site of his legions, he sent multiple dispatches to his agents in Rome, and throughout Italy. 
in Rome, with his term as dictator nearing its end, Caesar's agents pled his cause before the Senate, asserting Caesar's need to once again march his forces to face down the Pompeian uprising led by Cato, Metellus Scipio, and Titus Labienus in Africa. Unless the last of the Pompeians were brought back into the fold, civil war would continue to rage, threatening to tear the Republic apart. The Senate voted Caesar another one-year term as dictator so that he might, once and for all, conclude the civil war. Marcus Antonius, by order of the dictator, Caesar, was abruptly dismissed from the office of Magister Equitum, becoming a private citizen with no say in governmental affairs and no right to lead armies. In his place, Caesar elevated Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, having so competently managed the crisis in Hispania, and without bloodshed, to the office of Master of the Horse. To address the constant call for debt relief, which many of Caesar's political enemies underhandedly used to try and topple his flourishing regime, Caesar's agents around Italy were instructed by Caesar to borrow huge sums of money from wealthy landowners and local gentry who supported Caesar, promising them that Caesar would use the funds to put an end to the civil strife. Now more deeply in debt than any man in Rome, Caesar posted notifications throughout the city, as well as in Italy's towns, stating that no one stood to benefit more from such a debt relief law than Rome's most indebted citizen, Caesar himself. But to use his dictatorial powers to give himself an unfair advantage in alleviating his personal debt would be a gross abuse of his office. Suddenly Caesar's political enemies realized that by continuing to agitate for debt relief they were aiding Caesar rather than threatening him. Following Caesar's response, calls for debt relief mysteriously vanished, but Caesar's desperate need for money was far from over. Among Caesar's 7th, 9th, 10th, and 12th legions, mutiny broke out, incited by the legionaries of Caesar's 10th legion. After 13 years fighting for Caesar, the soldiers had become bitter, tired of waiting for Caesar to fulfill his promises of military release and land on which to settle. Their bitterness reached its apex following the Battle of Pharsalus, when Caesar, chasing Pompeius Magnus into Egypt, disappeared for several months, leaving the legions to languish in camp on the outskirts of Rome. Anticipating the worst, Caesar made discreet plans to defend Rome from these legions, and then he marched into their camp, where he climbed the rostra. The historian Appian tells us that Caesar's mutinous troops, knowing Caesar's need of them for his upcoming African campaign, did not dare to request monetary benefits from Caesar when he placed them in the spotlight from the rostra, asking what was bothering them. Instead, they sought to pressure Caesar into offering what they desired by requesting release from the legions. Caesar chastised the legions for having so little faith in him after having fought together for 13 years. Instead of addressing his soldiers as Romani from the rostra, Caesar cunningly referred to them as Quirites, a word meaning private citizen. In this way, Caesar released him from his service, which was the last thing they had intended. Realizing that Caesar had called their bluff, the mutinous legions now found themselves out of work. When the war finally came to its end, the dismissed legions would have no legal claim to rewards or land handed out by their commander. Shocked by Caesar's response, the rebellious legions begged for his forgiveness, pleading that he take them with him on this final campaign to Africa. Caesar refused, citing his great disappointment in their behavior, but ultimately relented, agreeing to take only the 7th, 9th, and 12th legions with him. As punishment for their role in inciting the mutiny, Caesar denied the 10th legion. The legionaries of the 10th then implored Caesar to reconsider, willing even to undergo the execution of every 10th man, known as troop decimation, if only Caesar would reinstate them. Finally, Caesar agreed to forgive the 10th legion as well. He did not decimate his troops, and did not put any of the mutineers to death. However, Caesar wrote down the names of the instigators and gave secret orders for them to be placed in the most dangerous positions for the upcoming battles. With the insurgents under control, Caesar loaded his troops onto transport ships. Without waiting for the remainder of his legions which were still being levied, and even leaving behind his supply vessels to come along later, Caesar sailed for Africa. Hastening his legions out to sea before another mutinous outbreak could erupt, Caesar sailed toward the Pompeian forces led by Cato, Metellus Scipio, and Caesar's old friend, Titus Labienus.